Greetings and salutations. This is Shade of Clay, where I am clay and I throw shade. I will be your host for this evening. A couple quick things before we dive into the video. Number one, this is not the kind of content I plan on making going forward. I have a passion for ranting about casual 2D point-and-click escape room games, like Ravenhurst or Rusty Lake. It'll be a lot more lighthearted, a lot less serious. My ultimate goal is to be the H-bomber guy for people like me who get carsick when playing or watching footage of Bloodborne. If that's something you're interested in, go ahead and subscribe. If it's not, then just doing the usual like, share, comment for the algorithm would be amazing. I have not really heard perspectives like mine of people who were there and were fans and were kids during that era of Shane out there a whole lot. And seeing as how I was on the really tame end as far as how I was affected by Shane's content, hopefully this video, even though it's being released by a complete nobody, can reach somebody else and help them to feel comfortable enough to speak out. This is not a video where I run down all the terrible stuff he's done. D'Angelo Wallace has made that video. It's great. Or it was when I first wrote this. Now it's deleted because of the James Charles situation, and honestly, I think that was a really bad move. There was a lot of good info out there, outside of James stuff. If you somehow are seeing this but never saw that, I'll link other related videos I find in the description. It's entirely probable that this video will not reach anyone. It is my first real video, after all. Uh, sorry for the mic quality, by the way. But it is a popular topic, so I honestly have no idea, and I'd like to be responsible on the .0001 chance it reaches more than 10 people. Second, trigger warnings. It is honestly impossible to really cover the whole scope, so if I miss something, let me know and I'll put it in the description or pinned comment. I am not going to get into the animal situations that Shane has been involved in because that is personally a really serious trigger for me that can send me into panic attacks. And I'd really appreciate if y'all didn't discuss that in the comments, if you could help it. Accidents happen and jerks exist, so I'm sure I'll have comments that intentionally or unintentionally hurt me in that way. That's just the risk I have to take in making this video, but if I can limit that as much as I can, that'd be great. Anyways, the very, very broad trigger warnings are for self-harm, CSCM, CSA, grooming, pedophilia, and then all of the isms for Shane's content. Racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, classism, etc. Usually these are all within the context of an edgy joke he made. Using shock value and mocking minorities was a huge staple of his content. If any of that stuff is too much for you, I completely understand. I love you. Take care of yourself. Go pet something soft and fluffy and watch Stardust. It's a great movie and has Robert De Niro as a pirate having an absolute blast dancing in drag while a sword fight set to classical music goes on upstairs. If that doesn't sound like a good time, I cannot help you. So, I was a Shane Dawson fan when I was in middle school. Not the Shane Dawson of the last few years, docuseries, empath, rebranded Shane, no siree. This was him at his most offensive, time of hey it's Millie and friends forever, and I was a fan. To give some context, I wasn't some neglected or traumatized kid. I had two parents who did a very good job raising me. I was doing fine at school, not great, but fine, and I had a group of friends. I was white, upper-middle-class, cis kid with parents who were still together at the time, and a support network. Of course, unbeknownst to me, I was neurodivergent at the wazoo and wouldn't get meds until a few years later, and I was a small lesbian child suffering through combat and trying to convince everyone, including myself, that I was straight. But other than that, I was, and still am, incredibly privileged. In fact, that privilege is part of what drove me to being a fan of Shane. And not just because I wasn't the target of a lot of his offensive jokes. Let me explain. When you're a privileged preteen going through preteen angst, you don't usually understand your own privilege. 
All you know is that you feel these negative emotions and the people around you who have a harder time than you are getting comfort and attention that you desperately want. So you start to feel jealous because there couldn't possibly be a depth of emotional torment as deep as yours. So clearly you also deserve attention and comfort, but you aren't getting it because of these trivial things like having an already established emotional and financial support system or not actually being in any danger. So you start to dramatize the negative aspects of your life. This is often where the romanticization of self-harm and mental illness comes in, because if you can have a scar to show or a self-diagnosis to point to, you can get some of that much-craved attention. Okay, I know it is so messed up that I find this funny, and trigger warning for self-injury, but a few years before I started cutting myself, or abrasing really, I used a dang protractor once, it was not that deep, I fell on the corner of my sister's cabinet and got a scar on my eyebrow. You could say that that was my first experience with shelf harm. But, um, I'm great at tonal consistency, as you can see. Discussions of serious topics mixed with a dad joke. That's me. Like and subscribe. So you can see the kind of kid I was. But you may wonder what the heck does this have to do with Shane's content? Well, for a young kid who wanted to feel edgy and special, who thought racism had ended with the civil rights era, and who was on YouTube in the 2010 to 2013 range, Shane's content was perfectly tailored for me. And YouTube was still at that point putting him on the front pages, so he was not hard to find. He was, embarrassingly, hands down my favorite YouTuber for those few years. I never bought any of his merch or went to see him at any conventions. I've never done that with anything I'm a fan of. But I'd watch him religiously, going to his oldest videos, watching them all in order. I knew that he was offensive enough that I never showed my parents his videos, but I rationalized that in my brain as they just wouldn't understand how very mature I am to understand these jokes. I was a kid, and as much as I was loath to admit at the time, I was very easily influenced. Thankfully, I was able to unlearn a lot of my biases in my later teen years. Not completely, that's a lifelong journey. I've still got plenty of work to do. I was also lucky enough to not stumble into too many situations where my biases, crude humor, and edgy, ironic racism could seriously hurt someone. But there was one instance that I still feel terrible about today. My best friend at the time was French and Pacific Islander, but my racist ass saw him a non-black brown person and thought, Latino! Because my perception of race was white, black, Asian, and Latino. Even though Latino isn't even a race. We also happened to have a Mexican restaurant in the area that rhymed with his last name. So I poked fun at him with that all the time even after he expressed his discomfort and had explained plenty of times that he was not Latino, I pushed it. And that was pretty horrible of me. That friendship was abusive in both directions, and we would both try to poke and prod at each other's insecurities so as to hurt each other as much as possible. But that doesn't excuse it. I regret a lot from that time, but that one... It hits a bit harder, because it was one of the few things that he couldn't really bite back from in the same way. I had that position of privilege over him, and I used it to hurt him. And even though I can see how Shane's normalization of that kind of joke impacted my ability to rationalize it, it's not his fault. He was a factor, but my bad choices were a much bigger one. We are about to get into the part of this video where I talk about CSEM. Uh, look on the screen if you want to know what that stands for. So if that is too much for you right now, skip to this time code. In Shane's early videos, kids are often depicted in inappropriate ways as the joke. This would go from making fun of teen moms, statutory assault, exploitation of minors in a sexual manner by themselves, their parents, or friends, or Shane and his characters. Nothing was off limits. I, as a kid, saw this, and I wasn't getting any of the education we get these days about online creeps. 
the internet was changing so fast and no one knew what impact it could have on children. I, for example, I didn't know that a kid could get in legal trouble from sending pictures of themselves until years later. I knew it was technically wrong, but I felt in control. I felt powerful and I was getting validation. My friends and I were using Kick, and I loved to do this kind of Tinder-esque friendship maker that was there at the time. Don't know if it's still around. There was a huge amount of pedos, and unfortunately, I was naive and dumb, and it took a little bit for me to learn how to spot a catfish, or to suspect when someone says their camera is broken, or to recognize those stock photos people would use. And that was just my impact from having normalized this kind of behavior from watching people like Shane online. I cannot imagine how much more dangerous it might have gotten for the people who wore his merch or went to events. Because predators knew his audience, and they absolutely used it to their advantage. Ironically enough, Shane's content led me to Onision after the latter did a musical intro for Shane. Thank goodness for me, I only submitted one picture to Onision's Rate Me forum, and he didn't choose it. And at that point, I was insecure enough to not try again. But everyone and their mother has gone over how harmful and toxic Onision and his content was, and while I was a fan of his for a couple months, it did not have nearly the impact on me that Shane did. Mostly because I was getting super into the atheist corner of YouTube. This was right before their eventual slide into anti-SJW content, which is actually a really interesting phenomena, and I might make a video on that if y'all want. Which, that led me to Repsion fairly quickly, and he was one of the first to call Onision out. I wish I could say I unsubscribed from Shane because I realized how horrible his content was. That I was too uncomfortable to keep supporting him. That I saw his bad impact on me and left. But that would be a lie. I left because he cut his hair short and switched to vlogs instead of skits. His new content bored the crap out of me and I moved on. I came out as gay, became a hardcore leftist anarcho-kami, started to realize and understand my privilege and bigotry, and all those years of watching Shane and his content was all but forgotten. I remembered that he was offensive, but it was a vague offensive associated in my mind with other media that was offensive to the mainstream, like Tim Minchin or Monty Python. The distinction between punching down and rebelling against authority was blurred when I was first engaging with these medias, and so, even though later I learned the very obvious distinction, the vague memory of them as comparable that remained. Then the Jake Paul docuseries came out, and Shane re-entered my field of vision. It was not really my cup of tea, although I did watch the Tana Mojo and Jake Paul series, and I watched and quite enjoyed the video where Shane talked to his dad. There was a part of me that was a little confused on how general society had let him do such a massive tone shift, but I had just assumed that he'd been forgiven and done repentance, and I let it go. I'll admit, I completely bought into his whole empath persona, at least partially because in his old content, as raunchy and inappropriate and offensive as it was, he had instilled the same image in my head of him as this kind and empathetic person. He was always candid about his depression and his body image issues, and when he put on the puppy dog eyes and the character of the empath, as he would do even in those old videos, I bought into it wholesale and believed that that was the true self. And I don't think it was a completely manufactured persona, I think just like all of his characters, there's an element of truth to it. And that leads me pretty well into one of the big points I wanted to make with this video. Shane Dawson is a pretty average person. Don't get me wrong, he has done horrible things and has built a brand off of stepping on others. But I think when we as a society write him off as this anomaly, as this uniquely malicious person, we ignore the ways that our culture and our systems led to the proliferation and spread of his more harmful characteristics. Cancel Shane Dawson, absolutely. But don't think that that solves the issues he embodies. I'm going to give a hypothetical description of his life that gives him and his moral character the most benefit of the doubt as I possibly can, while still leading to the same outcome. 
To be clear, I am doing this intentionally exaggerated version of events to underline how certain systems and societal norms might have affected the outcome, not because I think this narrative is true or correct. In fact, I sincerely doubt it. Also, before I get into it, I'd like to acknowledge this message that I'm trying to send with this particular point is not new information to a lot of people of color and members of other minority groups. They've been raised with the constant need to battle to prove that their humanity matters just as much as the humanity of the oppressors. Because of a society that constantly dehumanized them, not because they did terrible things, but just because of who they were as a person. So, hearing an argument against dehumanizing yet another privileged oppressor while they still suffer through dehumanization every single day, often spurred on by the very kind of content that people like Shane create, it's probably pretty tiring. I'll give a time code for those of you who want to skip that and get to the cute videos of my cat that I have at the end. And if you think I made any other missteps in the course of this video, please feel free to let me know in the comments. Also, feel free to yell at and insult me. That is also valid. And if there's anyone else here who might see a comment giving me valid criticism or even invalid criticism from people who are angry about how I might have mishandled something and wants to jump in to defend me, don't. I'm staring at the screen trying to think of how best to elaborate on that, but honestly, just don't. In case you're like I was two years ago and you haven't listened to many opinions from black creators, some suggestions I have are Cat Black, T1J, and T Noir, just as a jumping off point. Plus, I have a huge parasocial crush on T. She is absolutely stunning in every way. I'm very gay, so if you do check her out, tell her I sent you. Don't tell her about the crush, though. That's secret between you and me. Anyway, let's get into the most charitable possible interpretation of Shane's life story. Shane Yaw had a rough childhood. Being raised poor and struggling with obesity, he grew to learn that one of the only ways he could get positive attention from his peers was by making jokes, self-deprecating jokes in particular. It was a way to flip the script on a world that told him he was useless, by getting people to laugh with him and at him at the same time, instead of just at him. Eventually, because he felt so empowered by making jokes about his own minority groups of class and weight, he felt comfortable doing so to other minority groups that he didn't belong to. Uh, if they just learn to laugh along and take the joke, they can be just as empowered as he is, and if they can't, well, that's not his problem. Then came YouTube. This brand of humor he had cultivated started getting him more success than he'd ever seen in his lifetime. And when you're raised with a scarcity mindset and you find something that works to benefit your social and economic status, you cling on to that for all it's worth. Especially after it cost him and his mother their jobs. So he was in that additional panic mode of having this become not only his biggest source of income and validation, but his only source. So he's stuck with what worked. Damn the haters. He was doing this not just for himself, but for his family, too. So rather than listen to and try to address the ways he was hurting people, he shut his eyes and covered his ears and kept going. But eventually, he had reached a point where his scarcity mindset had faded. A point where he didn't need to pander anymore to win the respect of his peers. Now they had to win his respect. That feeling of power, of entitlement, pride, that was what came next. And how dare people like Francesca Ramsey question him. He had worked so hard and suffered so much, and he had earned... No, he was owed the ability to bask in the glory of his success without annoying snowflakes who couldn't take a joke, making him feel guilty. But eventually, that inflated sense of pride, that getting drunk off of the power, that faded too. And then the guilt started to set in. So he did a complete personality rebrand. Instead of being the Shane that got the most money, he would portray himself as the Shane he wanted to be. Empathetic, kind, sensitive, a good person. He left his old videos up because, well, people enjoyed them and there were so many worse things on the internet, so really, who was he hurting? And for a surprisingly long time, this rebrand worked. If he ever felt especially guilty, he could turn to his fans and express his doubts and receive a wave of validation. 
Things were going great, and it seems like he was right. The pain he had caused really wasn't that big of a deal. He was in the clear. And then came the fall. He threw all the methods that had worked before at the problem. He presented his justifications, his excuses, his reasoning. When that didn't work, he got defensive, lashed out, blamed others. He used his mental health and ooh, ooh soft boy persona that had gotten him so much praise and comfort in the past. But nothing seemed to be working. He even took down his videos and made an apology. But he couldn't erase all the harm that he had caused. So he ran. That is, I think, probably the most charitable interpretation of events that I could possibly go with without starting to rewrite history. It doesn't really touch on some of the more serious things, but if you read through that narrative, you probably know people, maybe you even are that kind of person, who you can see making those same mistakes. And while that is a horrible and depressing thing to realize about yourself or the people around you, it is important. It's important to recognize the humanity in evil. This recognition of humanity does not mean forgiveness, by the way. People were hurt, and recognizing the humanity in the offenders does not mean forgetting the humanity of the victims. That's why I started off with my own story, to remind that no matter how human and relatable some of Shane's motivations might have been, the pain and damage he caused to other human, relatable people in the end massively outweighs that. So why humanize him, you may ask? If he's still worthy of the punishment he's gotten either way, if whether he's humanized or not, he's still guilty of doing incredible amounts of damage, why does it matter whether we see his humanity or not? My thinking is, it's because by forgetting the human aspects of these people who caused huge amounts of pain, it can lead to bigger societal problems. For example, to get very political and raise the stakes up by a hundred for a moment, our writing off of Nazis as a political aberration, a unique evil that couldn't be you or your neighbors, that let our guard down to not notice the homegrown fascists and modern Nazis rising back up. And that is not great. Nazis. Not great. On the blue moon chance that Shane is watching this, please don't come back to the internet. That reputation of an empath that you had for a bit, that is never coming back. I'm sorry, but that is the truth. If you want to edit Rylan's videos or make stuff under a pseudonym, go ahead. I'm not saying you're banished from creating anything ever again. But the Shane Dawson brand, your face, your name, that is done. It's over. Trying to come back, always testing the waters, it's just going to prolong the pain from people like me who realized when you got exposed how much damage you'd done to them. Seeing you bounce back from that will make us feel as if our trauma is meaningless. I do still think you care about others, at least to some extent. So if you do see this, my advice is to make a final video owning up and stepping away, ending the Shane Dawson brand for good. Do quiet things like anonymous donations to the groups you've harmed, try and make up for the pain you've caused, Work on finding the next chapter of your life. Find a new passion that doesn't require a fan base. Focus on your personal relationships. And move on from Shane Dawson. Thank you guys so much for listening to that. That was that, there, and things. Yep have this video of my cat and my siblings cat have fun goodbye i don't know he's such a jerk
Hey, hey, hey. 